Okay, hopefully you've got my slides. There is a Microsoft Teams bingo. One of the, one of the lines is there uh, to tick off is, can you see my screen? Uh, hopefully you can. I'm going to work on the basis of silence and it means that uh, you can. So my name is uh, Dermot O'Reardon. Oh, no. What I do need to be working out is. Uh, and a bit about my background, and I feel uh, uh, to a slight degree an imposter. I do not pretend to be an absolute expert in everything SNOMED. But what I do think, I have a reasonable credit uh, 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 ability to claim some credit for is a bit of experience in the, in the, in the space. So in the past, uh, I was a medical director of my trust, and I also spent a, a period uh, as an interim chief executive. I am currently uh, the chief clinical information officer in, or the chief medical information officer, depending upon the title that you use uh, for my organization. I still am a practicing surgeon and I am on call this week. I have got somebody to cover me for the afternoon. I am elected as a member of the council of the faculty of clinical informatics and as a member of the digital health advisory panel. If I go a bit to my organization, uh, so I work in a hospital in the east of England it, it, it called West Suffolk. Uh, uh, it's about half, it's about uh, 40 kilometers to the east of Cambridge, go much further east and you end up in the Netherlands. Uh, we are a relatively small single site organization uh, that we like to think punches a bit above our weight. We have quite a good core strength in education with a link to Cambridge and all of their graduate medical school teaching is done with us. And uh, we have, uh, yeah, we get really pretty good outcomes for our sort of organization with a really quite strong reputation in the region for good quality practice, but also a lot of things on a national basis as well. And very highly rated by our staff and patients. And everybody would say that. I think we've got a good cause to, to, to say some of that. A little bit about the numbers that go through our organization. Uh, for our size of organization, it's quite, a, it's, it's, it's quite a lot. We have 4,000 staff now that we, because we also provide community care services in our uh, patch as well. In fact, we also now have uh, a general practice which is part of our organization too. And those are the numbers of the numbers of attending the emergency department uh, and out, uh, the outpatient clinics, et cetera. Like everywhere else, we are seeing rising demand. So we're getting, we have a pretty elderly population. We have all the associated chronic illnesses of obesity and the booze and, and the cigarettes, et cetera. And like the wider NHS, uh, and uh, even before COVID, uh, uh, like the country, we, uh, money is tight. Uh, and just so we've, uh, we, so we're, we're in a challenged situation uh, locally. The NHS is challenged, the and and centrally the U, the UK government is challenged, and uh, we've got the added bonus of Brexit to make it even harder on the horizon. From an IT point of view, until four years ago, we were running a variety of best of breed systems, uh, and one of the things about best of breed systems is that they often do the thing that they set out to do really pretty well. They may not necessarily always talk to other best of breed systems or other IT, bits of IT in your organization, but they do often do what they set out to do, that narrow focus, they do that pretty well. We, however, had a problem. We had a burning platform of our core patient administration system was going to cease to be in support and we had to do something. You could not run a, your organization when a mission critical piece of software uh, was about to, to, to run out of support. And it really, yeah, it was 20 plus years old, uh, old fashioned, almost DOS uh, blue screen technology. Again, did what it did pretty well, but didn't inter interface with many other systems. It could give feeds to other systems, but it couldn't take much information back. So we really were in a situation where doing nothing wasn't an option. 
being a relatively small organization, we were smaller and, and nimbler than some others. So we were not a giant super tanker uh, that is very, very difficult to turn around. We were much faster along the lines of something like Ben Ainsley's uh, high speed catamaran. So we're quick and nimble when we want to be. Uh, one of the problems of being quick and nimble is you can occasionally fall over. But given the situation that we were in, where we had to do something, we inevitably uh, had sorted out our future and our vision. And to give credit to my organization and to uh, the board that governs it, we did see that digitization on the horizon was a key way that we were going to address some of the challenges that we had in the future. So we went out to the market. And the story that we tell is when you are out there contracting, it is a bit like when you are dating. And all the various suppliers are coming and promising the earth and it's all sweetness and light at your candlelit dinners. And then you sign a contract. And that is a bit like conception. Now we happen to sign our contract with Cerner. We effectively had a choice. We could have stuck with the best of breed system. We could have gone with a system in the UK that was effectively being given away for free as a result of a previous botched government IT program, or we could go out to the market ourselves. And we did that and evaluated it. And on all the criteria that we measured, Cerno is what came out uh, and the ones that we signed our contract with. And once you've been through your procurement process, you've been through the dating and you've been pregnant, you then, uh, well, and your conception when you sign the contract, you are then pregnant and you go through all those stages of a bit of denial as an organization and anger and bargaining and can I just keep this little bit? Uh, and at the end of it, you accept that it's a fact of life and you've got to get what to do with it. Uh, and, and do you and go live and you panic towards the end and like all pregnancies when you first go live with a big electronic health system implementation you are delivering a baby but you're not just delivering one baby you're delivering at least triplets because you've got to get that basic IT system working you've got to interface with all the other systems and you've got to migrate all your data and not only are you delivering those triplets, but they are not necessarily fully functioning adults from the word go. They do take a considerable amount of nurturing to get them uh, in the situation where you are uh, really functioning like you want to be and really flying. We did at that time what was relatively unfashionable in the UK of a big bang implementation. I like to think we move from the dark ages on the left to uh, the phase of accelerated expansion on the right. And I am really proud of how our organization pulled together and made that a success. One of the markers of the success is that not long after we'd gone live, so 18 months, two years at most afterwards, the UK government set up a program uh, of what they called go global digital exemplars and they recognized that there was not they were not having to ask people to form an orderly queue to come to the UK to see how to do healthcare IT properly they realized that digitization was going to be an absolutely crucial part of some of the challenges in healthcare in the UK uh, and that uh, collectively as a country we hadn't really cracked it so this was a recommendation from Bob Wachter's report to set up these global digital exemplars. And in the first phase, they identified 12 sites with the potential to demonstrate what you could do with digitization and to share that learning. And you can go through the rights and wrongs of that program of whether it left some behind, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you can obviously uh, argue that I am uh, biased and conflicted, but I'd actually see why they were doing it. And I think it was a good idea. And each one of those sites got 10 million pounds, uh, which is basically these days, 10 million dollars or 10 million euros uh, uh, for matched funding uh, to, to try and take their, digital, their, their already reasonable progress and try and take it to a next level. And it was a pretty good accolade for West Suffolk uh, to have achieved that. Now, prior to that, my knowledge of SNOMED was really limited to the level of uh, I knew that it existed. 
I could not claim that I was in any way an expert in what SNOMED ha had to offer me. It came effectively bundled up with CERNA. And to give them their credit, and also this chap, uh, who is Charles Guttridge, who I'm sure for this audience needs no introduction, but is obviously a, a leading light and evangelist for the power of, sea, of, of SNOMED, I started to see the potential. But you have to bear in mind, this was me at the core of implementing our system. For the vast majority of clinicians and the wider team in my organization, SNOMED was at most an abstract contract, uh, concept. Uh, I have done a little bit of rectifying some of my, um, uh, um, my, my lack of knowledge, and I have completed this course relatively recently, so I, I hope I got a few brownie points from Charles. Uh, and I worked quite hard, and I was quite pleased with my A, because I did have to do a bit of work to actually under, to, to get through all that. And it then takes me to what did I want to achieve, and we, or we as a wider organization, wanted to achieve and when we were liaising with our clinical staff i did not want the doctors or any of the other clinical staff to get into the detailed nitty-gritty of coding similarly i didn't necessarily want to view coding as purely a way of maximizing the income for my organization and it certainly wasn't going to change the income for um uh, for the individual uh, clinicians on our staff who fundamentally are, uh, who are at, at, essentially are paid uh, on a, a salary basis. Interestingly, however, a small proportion of doctors in my organization and the same across many in the, in the UK, quite a few of my consultant colleagues, particularly some of the surgeons and anesthetists, do do some private practice as well. And some of those people can be very creative in their coding behaviors. And some of that is even uh, a little bit beyond what I would regard as ethically uh, sound, but that's a different. I did not want to have coding. Uh, and the, the key message was I didn't want the doctors to think I wanted them to code, nor was I asking them to do things to make certain that we were paid more and nor were they going to be affected by it. So how, how, did, we, how did we do? So, I am a surgeon by background. So one of the bits that I put in there was in our standard required organization wide operation procedure note, call it what you like, was a required field of a SNOMED procedure, of a, Sno of a SNOMED clinical term for the procedure. And, and that actually really was very effective it does get you into the situation where people start to get frustrated when they can't find something that exactly matches what they think they, they have done. I know, and you know as experts, that the vast majority is uh, of the terms, there is something very close, if not exactly matching what they want. That's not always the case as some things evolve uh, uh, or new, uh, as new procedures come into being. And even some of the terms, so this is an example one, where uh, I went looking yesterday because for a while I do upper GI surgery. It has bugged me for a while that if I looked up dilation of the bile duct, apart from the procedure, the only one for a while that I could find was cystic dilatation of the common bile duct. And as somebody who was a relative expert in that area, I didn't even know what the word cystic meant or what it added to the phrase dilation of the bile duct, common bile duct. And I did put in a, a change request and I was slightly surprised to see that it has actually changed. Now, whether I can claim any credit for that whatsoever, I don't know. But I do think we also need to be cognizant that the merest fact that I went to the length of getting a login, completing a form, uh, uh, and submitting a change request makes me abnormal. And it does mean that there was that maybe there has to be a better way of soliciting the broad brush ways of how from, from, the, from everyday clinicians and other people involved in healthcare might submit something that needs to be changed and then leave it to the experts to do, uh, to do the assessment and do it in more detail. I am fully aware that it makes me, by, almost by definition, atypical, the fact that I went to the lengths 
of, of submitting that sort of a change request. The other bit where we've had success in is in uh, the creation of what you can either call a discharge summary at the end of a hospital admission. And I will preface what my comments to say that I am predominantly a secondary care being, but I fully understand that when we discharge a patient from hospital, we are transferring care from one organization to another, to the general practitioner, and we are passing that baton. And every transfer of care involves a degree of risk. And how you can get that information done smoothly and safely and promptly is a challenge for all of us. And in there, we absolutely had that a SNOMED term for the, uh, uh, the diagnosis or the what we actually labeled as the, prob the, the this visit problem was a compulsory field. As an example in here, this is my discharge summary from my admission to my own organization with a COVID pneumonia. Uh, and so there at the bottom is how they have coded my lower respiratory tract infection. I will talk a little bit more about COVID a bit later on. But so those are, that is our discharge summary with the, the compulsory uh, field for the this visit problem. And it, it doesn't show any chronic health problems because touch wood, I'm reasonably free of those. The other bit where we made a success, and again, led by Charles uh, and others, is albeit on maybe a smaller scale, but still nevertheless pretty dramatic uh, uh, adoption is our use of Cerner's Health Information Exchange. So you can see in that, that when we went live, in a 12 month period, we have quadrupled the number of access, of, of views of the shared record just by our staff. And that obeys a rule by uh, one of my other sort of people that I respect is a chap called Joe McDonald, who says that if you provide something which is useful and is usable, then it will be used. And I think that is a motto that is really important for all of us involved in healthcare IT. If something is useful and usable, people will use it. And our challenge is to provide the useful and the usable, and then the adoption will work. Instead of sometimes us trying to, uh, you know, this is, this is not us, we've done no training courses about the use of health information exchange. Uh, uh, people have picked it up, they found that it serves a clinical need for them, and they are using it and it's gone up fourfold in a 12 month period and shows no sign of letting off. And in that, this is an example from one of my patients. Again, I, I have, I'm have i checking, I always get paranoid about that I've removed the patient identifiable data. Uh, this is one of my current inpatients. And then you get start to get into the, uh, so this is my view of the GP record of the problem list. And this is where you can then start to see where, where the problems with the problem list are, are become evident. The two overwhelming sections of the health information exchange that our hospital staff look at are the problem list that you're seeing and the list of medication. Those are the bits they find for looking at the GP record by far and away the most useful. But you can then start to see but how do you see the wood for the trees of what matters in that problem list? And at the moment, you can also see that it's not displaying SNOMED terms. So in theory, although GP systems in the UK are supposed to have switched to the use of SNOMED, that is not the information that that is being displayed. The other thing that you'll pick up from that display, um, I can't what I was going to say now. Oh yeah, is that this is read-only access. So, and that's transformative. So people, you, we would not be getting a fourfold increase in usage if it wasn't useful. So read-only access in and of itself is fantastic. But actually what I really want is the next stage of making that data structured and actionable. 
data that we can start taking the GP record of the problem list and putting that into the hospital record and to an extent vice versa. Perhaps where we have struggled more, and this is again, I'm on call this week, this is one of my current inpatients. And this is the clerk in the, the history, and, history and physical, I think, in the US. Uh, but this is the admission documentation for one of my patients. And that's where you start to see that we're not, we have not cracked every aspect of it. So it, the two arrows on the left are what my junior doctors have recorded in free text of their past medical history of ulcerative colitis in Raynaud's and hypothyroid. They've also documented the drugs in free text. To be fair to them, they have separately, and I did go and check, they have done a proper medicines reconciliation. But it does prove very hard to wean some of our medical staff away from free text and moving them towards structured, document, structured terms. So that on the right hand arrow, you can see that the problem list, the past medical history is blank. And that is despite the fact of this is somebody under my care. And I know for a fact that on Monday, I even said to my team that I have started the week with that I am you know, to, to try and uh, enthuse them, cajole them, berate them in all sorts of ways. I've tried every way I can, and I'm still not always getting it. They are getting better, but they haven't, by no means would I claim that we've always cracked it. Now, this is a particularly bad example where they've done nothing. Um, if I go to our doctor's handover list, you can see, and I think I've wiped out all the data. So this is, this, this is the handover list from yesterday, from yesterday evening. And for about half of the patients, or just over half, they've probably, they've got a, they have a this visit problem uh, and they have entered, they are beginning to start entering some of the chronic problems. So I, to me, it depends whether I'm currently in a glass full, half full or glass half empty mode as to whether this is significant progress on where we were a year ago or a sign that derma, I'm still failing. So I would be very interested to hear how people have managed to crack this. Now, I think some of that is our own fault and also to an extent um, to do with the systems that people, we are asking people to use. When we happen to go live, the technology that Cerner have was not as good as it was. And, they, and we, we tried to give people what we thought was being helpful of structured documentation to record the admission of a patient. And it, it was pretty clunky and almost en masse, they shifted to free text um, within a week. Now, the current version of what they would be given if we were starting from scratch now is a lot slicker around the workflow and makes it easier. But it is extraordinary. What, you can motivate people for a big bang go live, changing their behaviors once they've found a way of working proves very hard. And even when you have cohorts of junior doctors who turn over every four to six months, it is extraordinary how it isn't what I say that influences their behavior. It is how they learn from their predecessors about the way to function. And changing that practice and behavior is really surprisingly hard. And the other thing is, it is, it is that it's sometimes difficult to persuade them of investing the time to record the chronic problems that may benefit somebody else down the line, as opposed to uh, trying to get them, it make it easier for them to do the right thing the way that you want. And we are making progress, but I would absolutely say that we have not cracked it yet. It's also interesting that we, we initially, at the top of that column, which says this visit problems, it was labeled diagnosis. And it was very bizarre talking to doctors, uh, new doctors, who almost thought it was a beyond their pay grade at times, to be making a diagnosis. They thought that was the role of the consultant and the senior doctors, and their role was to present a differential diagnosis. And also to, to try and 
explain to them, and I don't, I think we need to work with medical schools on this, of that concept of an evolving uh, 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 this visit problem. It may be that one of my patients might come in with uh, right eyelid foster pain. And that might be the this visit problem to start with, but by the time they've gone home and had their acute perforated and gangrenous appendix taken out, you can correct that with something much more accurate. But trying to, to teach that as a different way of thinking is not always that easy. And I have mentioned, I've lost my mouse a minute. The problem with problem lists and that traditional one where people, and, and that's what comes hardwired out of medical school. In, certainly in the UK of what is the diagnosis and the past medical history as opposed to if you take for example somebody coming in with chest pain whose active chronic problem might be ischemic heart disease and in the history they had a myocardial infarction in 2018. That isn't necessarily the way that they are taught to think in medical school and unless and until we start to change that we are going to have ongoing problems. And then you get to this situation, particularly as you start sharing the problem list of who owns the problem list, who should curate it. And I would, if I was a general practitioner and I've got a carefully curated problem list, I would be a little bit upset if it gets then polluted by stuff from here, there and everywhere by people who haven't necessarily always put the, the thought in into the details that I have. How do you get rid of some of that old stuff? The stuff that which is, uh, stops you being able to see the wood for the trees. And then there are some things in the problem list that matter differently to different users. So if I was a neurologist, the particular type of multiple sclerosis or, or whatever diagnosis matters to me enormously. But for many other people, it's just a general high level bit. And how do you get the people who own that particular diagnosis to take particular pride and own that group of patients in your organization and in indeed across organizations in a health system? And then there may be some things which actually everybody needs to know and irrespective of whether they are a psychiatrist or a surgeon or anything in between. Is there a role for involving the patient in how you have an active, a, a, a fully comprehensive and accurate problem list. And then in amongst that are all aspects of the healthcare record are obviously sensitive and confidential, but some things are more sensitive and more confidential than others, whether they are safeguarding concerns or whether those are various sexual health type things or whatever, and who decides what is sensitive and who has access to some of the sensitive bits. If I then move on to where I think things are, are, are going, so we have put in across the organization now voice recognition and I do very strongly believe that voice as a tool to interact with the healthcare record is essential uh, and really will bear fruit in the future and how can we use the technology to make the workflow a smooth and seamless way of actually generating uh, structured data using the likes of SNOMED going forward that doesn't necessarily involve people going away to a specific place elsewhere in the record to enter those. What we want is people recording the consultation, the admitting the patient and recording uh, what's going on and seamlessly as far as is possible accurately entering structured terms. And that is where technology will work. And all of this is possible, but nobody has really, to my knowledge, quite cracked making this at work all the time uh, in, in actual everyday clinical practice. Then we come on to our old friend coronavirus. And it was quite interesting. I pay tribute to the people behind SNOMED of how they did get new terms out there pretty quickly. But that is only part of the story. And I certainly know locally that we had for a period to uh, work with the terms that happened to be in the, in, in the version that we had live and how that wasn't always easy. easy. And then 
once we'd got started using these terms, and you have to bear in mind, I, and I suspect it was very similar in countries around the world, our relatively small information team were being asked to compile endless reports. And actually how it, yeah, it was, it was actually really very hard for them to move from, they started recording in the, in the few terms that were suitable and available in the SNOMED list of terms at the beginning of the pandemic, changing midstream and actually putting in some of the more accurate ones to them just made life more confusing. And I was having to say to them, we do need to be accurate, but they were saying, but we have got these reports built on these terms. And if you change it all, we have to rebuild everything. And these are not big departments in most hospitals that are there to do that. And in addition, it isn't just a matter of SNOMED releasing the terms. It then needs to go to the various different uh, countries around the world who then get released, who then have to be uh, put into the uh, systems by the various vendors uh, uh, and then tested locally before it's implemented. So it's clearly, it was a huge challenge. I, from somebody watching from the sidelines, I was very impressed at how SNOMED managed to do that. But just doing that on its own wasn't necessarily solving problems just uh, uh, you know, because it's so much more complicated than just the release coming out. Other things where we have struggled a bit with is that money talks. And whilst we may be using SNOMED in a lot of places in our clinical record, at the end of the day, we get paid in ICD-10 and OPCS. And that sometimes, if that is what gets the hospital or your organization gets paid by, that tends to, set, to uh, focus the mind upon a, an awful lot of people in your organization. You then have the multiplicity of uh, different electronic health records. These are obviously only a tiny fraction of those that are out there, and they all do it slightly differently. And for those of us who are using systems which are predominantly starting from the US, it is almost sometimes as though SNOMED is a bolt-on extra, and it isn't really taking it to that uh, to, the, to the power of the level of what is possible in SNOMED. So, as an example, all of my procedures are coded in my organisation with a SNOMED term, but the laterality of whether it's a left-sided operation, a right-sided operation, or a bilateral, that is outside of SNOMED altogether because those systems are not built at their core with SNOMED at the heart. So as an example of how I have moved on a bit, and I now, from somebody who only four years ago, because we went live in 2016, knew very little, if anything, about SNOMED, I have now got a bit more knowledge, and I was involved with the, in the UK, what's known as the Professional Record Standards Body, uh, and was on their working group uh, for uh, the recording of diagnoses in a structured way. Uh, I haven't given you the reference, but I have shown you that if you Google, if you put into Google PRSB and diagnosis, the top choice will be their report. And I, I would recommend that you go and, and, and look at that. And so in summary, I'm proud of the achievements that I, uh, little old West Suffolk in the east of England, I think we've punched significantly above our weight. I personally have learned a lot. It is hard. The potential is huge. You need the whole system to change, not just fragments of it. Real world interoperability will drive adoption, but the focus has to be upon the workflow with voice recognition combining with technologies such as natural, natural language processing, uh, and that will make it better. And we also need to make it easier to do the analytics that harness the power. Uh, and I don't always think, certainly my organization, that our information team are fully aware of the power that's in there. And I think that was my final slide. So thank you, Dermot. Um, that was um, excellent. <laughs> um, so what, I suppose one comment from me, I think we've been approaching um, teaching clinicians about SNOMED the wrong way around. So I think we should probably take a leaf out of Tinder using your um, analogy earlier and the idea of running <laughs> some kind of antenatal classes where we all sit around and um, share a bit like the National Childbirth Trust is obviously the way forwards. Um, 
we'll kind of see where we go with that. <laughs> um, so one uh, one question um, from uh, Andrew that's in the Q and A at the moment. Um, so the issue about laterality, which you touched on, um, could you comment on whether you think some of the problem to do with that is to do with data migration, workflow, or just the burden of structured data, and whether using a pre-coordinated clinical interface is either a good idea or a bad idea? So I can only go, so I've, I have experience of using one system, and it's almost as though it feels as though it's, it's a bit of a, the snowman aspect of it is a bolt on. And therefore, we are putting in there something which it wasn't necessarily designed to do. And it is, it is uh, uh, would, be my, would be my summary of it all. I could, for example, you know, there, are, there is a term for a left inguinal hernia in snowmed. I would rather be able to, to, to but it, that is a pretty um, high level term. I'd much rather be able to say whether it was an incarcerated indirect hernia, which happened to be on the left. And to be honest with you, it, the systems that I um, uh, am using makes that a bit, am I still displaying my screen? I just need to stop that. So. Um, it's not as intuitive as it sh as it should be, and but I think that is where we have to work with vendors in making that more built around SNOMED and the power and potential that it has, rather than necessarily having bolted it on the side. If that makes sense, uh, it does. Uh, I'm just having a look if there's any other questions. Uh, so no. I think I think we're good. Uh, so I'd Ian, like, I'd, Ian, yes, uh, there was another question actually from Graham Ponting. Um, oh, hang on. Yeah, it's uh, which, um, I, I think I've probably managed to destroy the question. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's probably in, in answered. I think. Um, in in any case. Um, uh, uh, is is there a way of asking uh, Graham to re-ask the question or uh... no it's okay I can see the question you can yeah. uh, you can jump so um, yeah one, one one of the questions that's come in do you have the ability to cross map um, between SNOMED and OPCS4 and ICD do you use the cross maps so we so uh, and it may be a, a, a failure on my part of not having entirely sold the vision of why that would be helpful to, in my organization i think i yeah you know, there are commercial offerings out there that i think probably would make that an awful lot easier and do things in a way that meets the needs of our coding team our information team and the clinicians and it's probably partly i have put my own hand up and say that i have failed to make that case but I will continue to make that case because I think it, yeah, but it's got to be something that actually delivers tangible benefits to justify the cost. And I think it can be done, but clearly I, Dermot, haven't managed to do that just yet. Uh, can, can I just add, uh, Ian, that because I use the same system uh, as, um, as Dermot, it is, it is possible to view in the SNOMED browser that is implemented in Millennium. Uh, both ICD-10 codes and OPCS codes using the UK mapping. But it's a bit of a faff to get there. And frankly, I think uh, the number of clinicians who actually do look at that listing is quite small. Uh, and I, I'm uh, similar to Dermot that I have completely failed in persuading any of my clinicians to think of it in that way. Uh, and to use it as a way of checking actually what the professional coders are doing on their behalf. The problem, I, but I think there probably is, yeah, that is where, yeah, so we do now have in my organization, the ability to use APIs and fire interfaces, etc. And out, uh, yeah, I do, the eternal optimist in me, thinks that smart clever people will come up with ways which do that seamlessly uh, and put that in the right place in the record 
in a way which is useful to the coders and how they get paid is useful to the clinicians. But on the other, yeah, but it is also, it's pretty hard get into the back end databases of some of these big systems. Yeah. You're right, Dermot. So I'm good at identifying problems, Charles. But on the other hand, I, this is not me here to, you know, we have, you know, I am so proud of what we have done together with Cerner, but it, sometimes it is also hard. Uh, so uh, a couple of other questions. You're obviously not getting away with it. Um, so with regarding clinicians entering items in a problem list, does there, does there need to be a way to incentivize them to fill the lists out? And would having a or maintaining a patient shared care record help with some of those issues? So I, I, I'm absolutely a believer. So we have the patient portal. Uh, and one of our next steps will be giving patients access to their prop, you know, uh, uh, firstly promoting its use, but secondly, giving them an ability to suggest problems to add to the problem list subject to verification. Um, so I'm absolutely uh, signed up to that as a principle that you know, at the end of the day, it is their record empowering the patient to take ownership of it and keeping the accuracy. You then get to difficult conversations when the patient objects, the patient with a BMI of 45 objects to being labelled as being morbidly obese and that's a challenge for all of us. It is, it, you know, that is a statement of fact but you can also in amongst that statement of fact is a emotionally low charged label and patients don't necessarily always like, to, like, like that and that can produce attention. How I, I, I'm also a biggest, my, as far as getting clinicians to do it, the, the holy grail is uh, making the workflow produce the structured terms in the background relatively seamlessly and getting the, doc, the clinician who has typed out that the patient has chronic kidney disease and getting that and capturing that as a structured clinical term. Technology will start to help. But it, it's, it is not, I don't think it's, you know, the, I don't think it's incentives that will make that work. I think it is making it easy for them to do it and almost not having to think about it. And I do, again, the optimist in me does think that the technology of natural language processing and AI and machine learning, et cetera, has a part to play in that. And, you know, the likes of the, you know, the, uh, you know, the big providers and, you know, the big people out there, the Amazons, the Ada of this world, and, you know, you know, that's the power of speech and for them to be able to turn that into structured data is in, enormous and it will come into healthcare. Uh, so uh, another question, do you, so we, within your hospital, do you have champion clinicians that really, I suppose, champion the structured data and SNOMED coding or is it just you? Uh, I'm not entirely a lone voice, but I wouldn't say that I'm, yeah, I, I'm not sure I'd make a, a football team, let alone a rugby team. Uh, so the other one, so uh, with, with problem lists, the problem, the problem with problem lists um, is differing requirements and the fact they need constant curation. Do you find that an issue? Absolutely. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> But then, yeah, um, yeah. But some of my general practice colleagues have really, in, really, really take pride in it. It does vary from GP practice to GP practice, and probably even within practices as to how they do that. I probably would regard the GP list as the definitive source of truth, from which other things hang off. Uh, would be my hunch, but delivering that it, it is, yeah. But as we start to, you know, everybody starts having access to other bits of uh, information across the shared records, it starts to become easier, particularly if we move away from the read-only views uh, at the moment to more structured ways of, 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 and transferring of, 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 of structured data. That will begin to make it easier. But I do regard the GP record probably as the definitive source of truth in the UK context. And I think if you supplement that with the patient owning it, and giving them access, that's with, combined with technology is where I think things will go in the, in the hopefully not too distant future. 
Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> um, we've managed to so we've managed to clear all the Q and A's, which is excellent. So uh, I'd like to thank you again. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation, and from the comments, I'm sure everyone else um, in the audience also enjoyed your presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm just